Right, we will go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone. Welcome, I'm Sarah Walker, the Walden Woods Projects Education Director. Thank you so much for joining us for our event with Ben Killam tonight. For those that do not know us, the Walden Woods Project is a nonprofit based in Lincoln, Massachusetts, that preserves the land, literature, and legacy of Henry David Thoreau to foster an ethic of environmental stewardship and social responsibility. Our organization was founded in 1990 by recording artist Don Henley, and this past April, we celebrated our 33rd anniversary. This is a Zoom webinar, so you are only able to see the hosts and the panelists. Please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen if you're having tech difficulties, and we will do our best to help you. You can also use the chat to correspond with each other. And if you would like closed captioning, you can click the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. There will be an audience Q&A during the last 15 minutes or so of our event. Please enter any questions throughout in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and we will get to those later. And I'll now turn it over to Kathy Anderson, the Walden Woods Projects Education Director, or Ed Executive Director, who will kick off our program for tonight. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for an informative and fascinating presentation about black bears, along with some of the cutest photos and videos you have ever seen of black bear cubs. As Sarah said, my name is Kathy Anderson, and I am the executive director of the Walden Woods Project. And as my colleagues and friends can attest, I love bears. <laughs> I've traveled to the wilds of Barrow, Alaska, Churchill, Manitoba, Yellowstone, the Tetons, Katmai, and Kodiak Island, not to mention New Hampshire and Maine, for the express purpose of getting a close-up glimpse of these extraordinary creatures. And so I am thrilled to welcome tonight's presenter, Dr. Ben Killam, who is renowned for his work with New Hampshire black bears. Ben is a highly respected independent wildlife biologist, a researcher, and the author of numerous books and articles. His groundbreaking efforts to raise orphaned bear cubs and return them to the woods have been featured in documentaries on the National Geographic and Discovery Channels and on Jeff Corwin's Wildlife Nation. His extraordinary partnership with Chinese researchers who relied on his expertise to reintroduce rare giant pandas to the wild was chronicled in Pandas, an IMAX 3D film. And his collaborative work involving panda preservation continues to this day. At the Killam Bear Center in New Hampshire, he and his colleagues have reintroduced 350 orphaned cubs to the wild. As the human population increasingly encroaches on bear habitat, it is not surprising that encounters with these magnificent creatures are on the rise. I am shocked to see the all too frequent news stories of panic that ensues when a black bear is spotted in a suburban excuse me, suburban Boston neighborhood, doing nothing more than being a bear. We need not fear these animals, but we do need to respect them. Replacing fear with respect evolves from knowledge and understanding. Many people are aware of the Kill and Bear Center's critical work in rescuing, rehabilitating, and releasing orphaned, abandoned, or injured bear cubs but they may not know the essential work the center conducts in educating the public about how to coexist with black bears. The Kill and Bear Center relies on public support. It costs $1,500 to raise just one bear cub. I have donated to the center for many years now. I hope you too will support the critical work of Ben and his colleagues with the donation or with the purchase of one of Ben's books or videos by going to killam, K I L H A M, bearcenter.org. You'll be glad you did. It's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Ben Killam. Thank you. Uh, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I started working with black bears about 30 years ago. 
and I came at it from rather an unusual angle. <clears throat> I graduated from the University of New Hampshire in 1974 with a bachelor's degree in wildlife and hope to go on to graduate school to do the kind of work I'm doing today. Unfortunately, I'm dyslexic and my grade scores and test scores were low and I failed to get into graduate school. As a result, I went west to a trade school and learned the art of gunsmithing and employed myself as a custom gunsmith and gun designer over 30 years. In 1984, we returned to New Hampshire. Uh, I met my wife, Debbie, at Colt Firearms, where we, where we both worked in the product engineering department. And upon my return to New Hampshire, and I started uh, my own shop, I had an opportunity uh, to do the kind of work I wanted to do. I had a leg up on this because my father, Lawrence Killam, who was a virologist at the Dartmouth Medical School, studied birds as an avocation. He wrote life histories of the woodpeckers of the United States, as well as, as well as a book on crows and ravens. So I helped him with his studies and the type of studies he did I could do. It was a matter of observation and documenting with good field notes, uh, but the qu quantitative science of today was uh, a little bit more than I cared to uh, endure. Uh, my sister Phoebe and I became wildlife rehabilitators. Uh, she, she was involved with the husbandry like my mother was, and I was interested in doing uh, uh, behavioral work like my dad had done. I was hoping to get a hold of a bobcat or a coyote or maybe a fisher or the large woodland weasel we have. I never thought about black bears because uh, black bear rehabilitation in most of New England wasn't a possibility. But one day a conservation officer broke departmental policy and brought us an 11 month old cub that he thought had been hit by an automobile. It turned out uh, the cub had not been hit by an automobile and it had no infectious disease, but it had the shakes and wobbles and couldn't climb or stay on a branch. Uh, I was I wanted to know what the cause of this illness was, but the cub was quickly confiscated from me for a lack of a permit. Uh, the conservation officers came and confiscated the animal. Later that year, I got a call from the director of Fish and Game in New Hampshire and he asked me if I'd take that bear back. And I assured him that my reason for wanting it was to find out what was wrong with it. Uh, we kept it until it could no longer fend for itself. And ultimately we had to euthanize it. We sent its brain out to a wildlife disease lab in Wyoming and got a diagnosis of lysosomal storage disease. The human equivalent of that is Tay-Sachs and is caused by inbreeding in the population. Well, it turns out there's been a number of bottlenecks in the black bear population, um, beginning with the fact that in the 1850s, 85% um, of New England was agriculture. Uh, the forest habitat of the black bear had been cleared and their populations reduced to small island populations where this type of inbreeding might have occurred. Since that time, we've had a number of other congenital illnesses from congenital kidney diseases to uh, congenital heart diseases. And uh, the fact that we're actually rehabilitating black bears has given us an opportunity to identify these things which would otherwise go unnoticed. Over the course of the, time, the years that we've been doing it, uh, the number has gone up from 350 to 600 that we've rehabilitated and returned to the wild. Last year, we had 138 cubs, which was our, the record year for us, which was due to the fact that uh, we had a drought summer, which reduced the berry crop. On top of that, there was a year which happens periodically of no beech nuts and no acorns, so no fall mast. So any cub that got orphaned for any reason ended up moving into residential areas in search of food and then being brought to the center. This year, uh, we've had, we had a, an abundance of rain, good berry crops, good, good fall mass crops, and we now have 16 cubs at the center. So we have to have a center that's prepared uh, to handle those ups and downs, and they're they're quite uh, ranging ups and downs. 
Um, in 2018, we became uh, the Kill and Bear Center, a nonprofit. Uh, and that was a, a very good move. Prior to that, my wife, Debbie, was working and, and was the major contributor to the Kill and Bear Center, but we were limited in what we could do. And when we became a nonprofit, foundations discovered us and uh, foundations like to build buildings. And this is our new center. It has uh, hot and cold running water, heat and air conditioning, indoor cages for assessing the cubs, a uh, cub barn on the end, and uh, an 11 acre forested enclosure attached to it. Uh, this is inside the cub barn. Uh, la again, last year we had an extraordinary number of cubs. So we had uh, over 40 bears in the cub barn, another 40 up in the 11 acre enclosure. And uh, our, our old, old cub barn, which uh, we didn't think we were going to have to use again, was in pretty dilapidated shape. Bears are, are hard on equipment. They'd, they'd cribbed it and chewed it, and the braces were rickety, and I tore it out and made it my tractor shed. Uh, but with the number of bears we had last year, we had we were forced to renovate it, and we were fortunate that one of our directors, Bob Green from Green Woodlands, donated two of his employees for two months to do the renovation, and we ended up with another 40 cubs uh, in this, another view of the renovated cub barn, old cub barn. And now we're working on a, on another uh, center uh, like uh, the new one we built. And the reason you might ask, why, why do we need so much space? Well, the, you know, when you have 138 cubs and you're going to release them in June and the new bears start coming in right away, uh, anywhere from January on, you have to have a place for the new bears. So uh, if we only got bears every two years, it wouldn't be a problem, but we get bears every year. And so we're beginning to break, we're about to break ground for uh, a new cub barn, uh, which will be a little bit larger and better designed. We learn a bit, a little bit every time we build one of these and hopefully we'll be set. There'll be an eight acre enclosure, uh, forested enclosure attached to this one. We get very young cubs. Uh, from den disruptions. This happens when uh, often from logging operations where the fellow bunchers are cutting trees right up until the mud season comes in the fall. They leave bunches of wood in the forest and return to get them in the winter. By that time, the bears have moved in and had their cubs. And that sometimes causes a den disruption. Sometimes people are building a, a new house and have a cleared the lot for and had a big brush pile in the winter time they burn their brush and go into the brush pile with an excavator and the mom comes out and abandon the cubs. We get cubs like this one from Vermont that was denned up under somebody's deck. It came out in January, badly frostbitten, emaciated. We had to put it on subcutaneous fluids uh, for over a week before it would eat solid foods but we were able to release it in June wing, uh, well over 45 pounds. This cub got hit on Interstate 89 with a, a broken leg. Fortunately, it, it could be cast and it healed. It was released a couple of years ago. This cub was in the 138 cubs we had. Uh, we released this, this spring, past spring, uh, we got sent this picture the, with a cub with a bad gash in its belly. Uh, Fish and Game caught it and it indeed had a bad gash. Fortunately, it hadn't broken into the intestinal cavity. This is our veterinarian, Walt Cottrell, and my nephew, Ethan. They cleaned up the wound, sewed him up, and he was released uh, this past spring as well. Inside the forested enclosures, we have these uh, safety trees, uh, which the cubs like to sleep in. Um, even the wild bears with their cubs, will, the moms will sleep at the base of the tree and the cubs will be up in these big pine trees. Uh, our forested enclosures have seven strands of high tensile electric fence uh, with a plastic deer fence that 
that forces the Cubs to climb or and prevents them from running through the electric fence. Uh, the Cubs uh, understand that there's two sides to a fence. In this picture, there's a cub on the inside and a wild female on the outside. Uh, so it's not only the scent of wild bears that pass through the enclosures, but wild bears visit uh, as well. The young bears that come to us, uh, but without experience with their mothers, which happens every spring, uh, either the, the bottle-fed cubs, or in this case, it was a, uh, a cub that was uh, two pounds in April, and this is its first walk in the forest at six weeks at uh, uh, six weeks old. Uh, no, it's older than that. Anyways, uh, one thing we try to do is to get them into the forest as quickly as possible. Cubs within them have a genome that will respond to a natural environment. Uh, so. So giving them that complex environment and providing it safely is what a mother bear does as she walks them around the environment. These cubs will follow automatically. It's instinctive for them. So it's not hard to take them on walks in the woods without them running off. My nephew, Ethan, who, who's the single caregiver for the Cubs, uh, who has taken over my sister Phoebe's job, uh, now uh, is in charge of raising the bears. And this past year, uh, we had a, three or four bottle fed Cubs and a lot of other Cubs their age. And he was walking uh, at first the three or four, then the other ones figured out what was going and going on and started following. He ended up with nine cubs. Uh, here they are frolicking in a clover field. This is outside the enclosure. These cubs could run off, but they don't. They follow him wherever he goes. And then, these are shots from uh, Kill em Bear Center Instagram. Uh, Ethan has started an Instagram page where it posts on a regular uh, occasion of the, of the activities of the Cubs. Here they are uh, at the day at the spa. Bears use water to cool off and, and clean their fur. They're in walls or swimming at least four or five times a day during the summer. And here's the cub feeding on blueberries with a view. When I started doing this work, I walked my cubs uh, for long distances, uh, the first two cubs and then the next three. Uh, we had far fewer cubs at the time, but I needed to answer some uh, questions that had come up uh, and to design the program we have today, I had to learn about their behavior. And uh, the literature said at the time that a, you could release a cub into the forest at five months old and it would survive. I had a hard time with that. The mother bear needs 18 months, and I didn't understand why these guys were so smart that they could see that a bear only needed five months. And I found that uh, there's um, development over time or ontogeny with bears, just like there is with humans. And a bear cub wasn't ready to be on its own until it was 18 months old. And at that time, it was ready to take on the whole outdoors and leave its mother's home range and travel by itself. So I took these cubs on long walks up to nine hours at a time. 
It gave me a, a chance to observe them at very close distances. I could take them for walks wherever I wanted to go and see their response to their natural environment. One of the cubs that I walked this way was a bear named Squirty. Uh, I've written about her in, in both of my books and she's been in all the films that National Geographic and others have done on my work. Uh, Squirty came to me as a three pound cub that was six weeks old. Uh, I walked her uh, in the wild with her two siblings. And uh, when she became of age, I put a radio collar on her and fo followed her into adulthood. She became the dominant female in the area and managed a greater home range that she shared with daughters and granddaughters. Squirty is, uh, will be 28 years old in January. Here she is last summer, uh, still looking like a vibrant bear. Um, Squirty managed her, her uh, her, her family unit uh, with a matrilinear hierarchy, Squirty is in top center. And to her right is her oldest daughter, SQ2, and below her is a uh, uh, granddaughter, SNLO. And directly below Squirty is a younger daughter named Brooke, and then another granddaughter named Two, and a subadult named SQ2LO. It's, it's a, a matrilinear hierarchy and that Squirty will chase all the females below her in the hierarchy. Uh, the number two female will chase all the females below her in the hierarchy. Number three female will chase everybody below her and everybody chases the subadult SQ2LO. This ensures that Squirty will have the highest quality foods in the greater home range and will be able to pick the the best home range of the bunch for herself. Um, and uh, it, it also helps manage the uh, naturally way of managing the bear population. The subadult SQ2LO, normally a female will have cubs at age three, but because she was being pushed by all those above her in the hierarchy, she didn't have her first litter of cubs until she was five years old. Uh, bears uh, could manage their own population based on a natural food supply, but unfortunately there's nothing natural about the bear's food supply <clears throat> with the amount of bird seed that, and other foods that enter the food, human foods that enter the food chain from our unsecured garbage to agricultural crops. Even logging increases the productivity for bear habitat. Uh, so, so bears benefit from humans uh, tremendously, and it increases the productivity of the bears. Uh, here's the paper that I published on uh, matrilinear hierarchy in bears. It's available on our website, killandbearcenter.org. Uh, I got my PhD at age 65 from Drexel University, and I'm in the process of trying to publish some of the papers uh, uh, that I had on, on my uh, thesis. Uh, I find it's a, dif a difficult task, uh, to say the least. Uh, this was the first, uh, but we have several more in process, uh, but they all seem to take way too much time. So I'll leave it at that. The young males that came <clears throat> into the study area were quickly chased off. In this series of photos, Squirty is going after her grandson. I saw this little guy chased by her grandmother, by her mother, by her aunts, and any other bear could lock a target on him. And by September of his second year, he left the greater home range and joined the population of male bears in the upper valley. Here's SQ2LO as an adult. One of the things the females did cooperate on was chasing male bears out of their home ranges. And here she is chasing a male bear uh, out of study site. The large males that came into my study site uh, were the 300 pound plus males that did all the mating. And after the mating season, they would hang around to take food from the females because of their size, they could. 
That only lasted so long. And this series of photos, Squirty weighing about 170 pounds, is going after a 300 pound male and asking him to leave. And the males leave and they don't come back. Uh, this suggests that there's female choice in mating because if there wasn't a repercussion, these large males would stay and compete with the females in the female home ranges. The big surprise in my study was that when I took uh, Squirty into the uh, woods as a, as a as a yearling with her with her um, siblings, uh, we ran into this female on the left, a bear we called Moose, and uh, I took. I had a remote uh, enclosure that I kept them in, and I walked them up to the top of the ridge because the first set of cubs I raised encountered wild bears on a number of occasions, and I hoped to see them encounter a wild bear of some sort. They marked all the way up the ridge, and when I walked back down, they marked all the way back to their enclosure. The next morning I got there, and they were gone. Uh, I had a, call, a radio collar on one of them. I hiked up to the top of the ridge where they were. And normally if I got close enough, I could call them and they'd all come to me. Uh, these were all bottle fed cubs. And when I uh, called them, they ran from me. So I knew something was going on. So I waited until the next day and I caught them feeding in a beach stand. I got the wind right. I tried to sneak into the beach stand but unfortunately, I broke a large stick. My two cubs ran and treed up a large red maple tree and started a nervous moan. And this female that we call Moose came over. She's unrelated to my cubs, and she false charged me in defense of my cubs. And that was a big surprise. And then finally, my scent got up to my cubs. They recognized me. They came down out of the tree, greeted me nose to nose. And then they pinned their ears and bit me on my forearms, punishing me for interrupting their time with this wild female. Now, ever since that time, Squirty has given access to her resources, which is the study site where I provide a small amount of corn to any bear that shows up. I watch them every day from the time uh, the snow leaves in the spring until it returns in the fall. And, uh, Squirty allows these unrelated females access to her resources, and she shows less aggression towards them than she does her family members. I described uh, what she does with her family members. Uh, for her family members to stay in that greater home range, they have to comply to her rules, and it's not until she gets compliance do they get to stay. But these unrelated females uh, were able to stay, and there was very little uh, aggression towards them. And this I saw as a huge parallel with human behavior because after all, we're much harsher on our family members than we are on strangers. And we're harsh on our family members because they're our closest cooperators and communicating with them is terribly important. And we say things to family members that we'd never say to strangers and we get away with it because we can always reconcile with a family member. You'd never go up to a stranger and rank them out the same way you might a family member because you might not be able to reconcile and, you might, and they might be important in your survival sometime in the future. So to see this type of behavior in the black bear, this is called uh, reciprocal altruism, tit for tat with a time delay. So Squirty controlled an oak ridge and the resources at the clearing, moose, and her clan controlled, controlled 23,000 acres of beach. In a year when there was no beech nuts and only acorns, Squirty let moose and her crowd onto her oak ridge. And in years when there were no acorns and only beech, Squirty and her clan could go and feed beech on, on moose's home range. Uh, this is uh, a very human behavior. Um, it's like inviting your neighbor over for dinner and they feel obligated to invite you back over for dinner. They don't do it because they're nice, they do it because it's in our genome to do that. This type of behavior has been looked for in the great apes and has never been found. Uh, chimpanzees share 99% of our DNA, but they don't share our social behavior. 
Chimpanzees are group social. They have fixed territories with family units living within those territories. And things like culture rarely pass over those borders. Bears are able to meet another bear, make friends with it, and, and cooperate with it. The male bear social behavior was much more difficult to study. Uh, female bear, if you've got a female bear in your area, she's your female. And if you uh, see a second female bear or something happens to her, that second female is, is probably a daughter or a granddaughter of the first female. Uh, the male bears uh, uh, are generally unrelated in an area. They're transient. Uh, I, I noticed in my study area where they'd done uh, logging and the berries came in and the insects were available, there'd be an abundant amount of bear sign. And I went in to see what was going on. I had put down small amounts of corn and cameras. I would easily film eight to 10 different males and the resident female. But the big surprise in my study was I many times I would get two males sharing that small amount of corn. Now these bears are not related. These are, I've done had done the DNA of the bears in my study area. The UNH Genome Lab has has done the hair samples that I've collected, and again the males are genetically unrelated. These are male coalitions. Uh, uh, it's mutualism between unrelated animals. Uh, it's not reciprocal altruism because there's no time delay. They're benefiting at the same time, but it's just as interesting and, and carries the same ty types of conditions like friendship and things like that, moralistic aggression that go along with it. All of this is about uh, food. In the spring of the year, the bears are eating what I call emerging growth. These cubs are climbing a red oak tree to feed on the oak leaf starts as the buds first break into leaves. Uh, in this time of year, you can drive around and see bears at the edge of agricultural fields, feeding on succulent grass. They're feeding on nodding sedge in the woodland trails. They, they feed on the beech buds and then the beech leaf starts and beech leaves as late as the middle of June. Uh, this year, uh, there was only emerging growth because there was no leftover nuts from last year. Because of this, the bears, uh, there's very little competition for food this time of year. And because of this, the bears pick the spring of the year for their mating season. The female bear comes into asterisk beginning in the middle of May and continues on to the first week of, of July. Uh, the male and female bears spend three to seven days together, and the result of that uh, uh, union is a two-celled organism called a blastocyst. They're delayed implanters. Uh, the blastocyst doesn't implant into the uterus until late November, early December. Then there's a short gestation period of 50 to 55 days. Um, cubs are born in the dead of winter around the 1st of January. Uh, weighing less than a pound. <laughs> they continue to develop <coughs> in their mother's fur. Excuse me, I gotta grab something to drink. I'll bear back. They continue to develop in their mother's fur and don't leave the den till early to mid-April. Well, the first thing the mother bear does when they come out of the den is to find a good climbing tree <clears throat> where the cubs, <clears throat> she'll coach the cubs their very first attempts to climb. And she'll stay at that den site for over a month until the deciduous leaf leaves come out and give her cover to travel and the cubs are adept at climbing and following. This is Squirty's daughter meeting her mate for the first time. You'll be, you'll see that uh, she doesn't know this big guy. She's a little aggressive with him. 
Uh, he's calm and collected. He's been out Don Monning around. He's opening and closing his mouth, detecting, uh, expelling moist air from his lung, picking up her condition of estrus. You'll see the size difference. It's called sexual dimorphism. Females put all their extra energy into growth, and the males uh, put their extra energy into getting as big as possible to compete to mate. <laughs> He then pursues her and finally catches up with her and grabs her with his forepaws and bites her behind the neck. All of this aggression and the bite behind the neck uh, stimulate the female to ovulate precisely at the time of mating, which ensures that conception will take place. Uh, in this case, she broke away from him. There was another 20 minutes of pre-courtship behavior, which is pretty spectacular. There's pictures in my book uh, out on a limb of this, op standing up, open mouth wrestling. It, it's quite a display. And, by, and uh, then he got a hold of her a second time. This time he was with her for about 45 minutes. And during that time, another female walked by rubbernecking as to what was going on. And finally they broke up and went into the forest. Uh, the cubs are born in the mid of winter in January. Uh, weighing less than a pound. And uh, by midsummer, the, the female is traveling throughout the home range, acting as a protective umbrella, giving the chance the cubs a chance to learn in that complex environment. The cubs will den with her mothers uh, as yearlings uh, the following winter. And the next spring, after the female is, has mated, uh, family breakup will take place. This is Squirty's granddaughter grooming picks from a yearling son. In a very tender scene. But in less than a week, once she's, she's made it, this will all end. He will turn into a very aggressive bear. And this, this female bear chased one of her cubs up a tree. And every time her cub thought about coming down out of the tree, she'd run back up the tree, uh, reminding her cub that it was over. I watched this female go all the way to the ground, run back up the tree nine times in 10 minutes. Well, if you wonder how powerful a bear is, just think about climbing into the apple tree in the backyard. Eighty-five percent of the black bear's diet is vegetative. The remaining ten to fifteen percent is animal protein, and of that animal protein, ninety to ninety-five percent is ants, bees, and grubs. Bears are opportunistic predators, which means they don't respond to movement or sound in the forest like a bobcat or a coyote might, uh, but they will take advantage of disabled or, or weakened animals. Uh, unfortunately, chickens fall into that category and uh, chickens are a big problem with bears. Uh, we get a, lot, a number of cubs every year from mother bears that are shot at chicken coops. This can be prevented with a good electric fence with bait on it. By bait, I mean keep um, either peanut butter or bacon grease or bacon, something wrapped around the wires. So when a bear approaches the chicken coop, uh, it's attracted to that smell. It'll touch it with its nose or tongue. And once it gets zapped, it won't have any more interest in what's behind the fence. All livestock can be protected in this fashion, and there's no need uh, to be exchanging uh, chickens for dead bears. Here are the cubs going after ants. The ants give off formic acid when they're disturbed, which excites the bears to dig rapidly for them. They have a very sticky saliva, so they can lick up the ants very easily.
In the spring of the year, uh, the bears are eating succulent uh, vegetation that grows around wetlands, uh, jewelweed or touch me not that grows in everybody's yard, several species of wild lettuce. And the most important is jack in the pulpit. And jack in the pulpit has a root or a corm that's more nutritious than beech nuts or acorns. And a year like this past year, when there were no nuts, uh, the bears relied heavily on jack in the pulpit. The bear can be happily feeding on jack in the pulpit in an old orchard with maybe three feet of vegetation, and you'd never know he was there unless it stuck its nose up in the air and smelled black oil sunflower seed. A tube of black oil sunflower seed is 20,000 calories. And that's what a bear needs per day during hyperphagia. Uh, the average bear needs to put on 30% of its body weight and fat to survive the winter to hibernate. A female bear giving birth to cubs needs to put on 50% of her body weight and fat uh, to, get, to give birth, to get through the winter and have reserves for the early spring. So if you want to understand why bears are so attracted to food, uh, you understand that they have to store this foot, uh, fat to survive and give birth. Uh, think about humans and, and money. We put our money in the bank. We get all we can uh, to fund our retirement or put our kids through school or to buy a fancy toy. You wouldn't go home in the evening and scatter $100 bills all over your lawn and have the expectation that nobody would pick any of them up. And that's the same expectation we have when we have food attractants in our yard. The natural foods that put on the fat so the bears can reproduce and get through the winter in New England are red oak acorns and beech nuts. Uh, again, last year there were none, which uh, puts a big crunch on bears. Um, everything about bears is affected by the natural food supply. In years when there's good natural food supply, the amount of bear conflicts go down. Uh, in years when there's no natural food in the woods, the number of bears shot during the hunting season goes way up. Uh, so uh, natural foods are extremely important uh, for bear survival and how they get along with people. Uh, bear dens, This I'm crawling out of a den here <clears throat> under a old root mass of a tree that had gone over many years before. When I crawled into the den and looked uh, up, there was a matrix, a matrix of live roots uh, that prevented the soils from collapsing down on the female and her cubs during the wintertime. Uh, they, they use rock dens anywhere a cavity forms in the rocks. Uh, we have a, a, a study with New Hampshire Fish and Game where we try to keep collars on 10 wild females. We go to the winter dens and uh, Fish and Game's interested in the health and weights of the cubs and the mother. Uh, I go in to change batteries on the collars and to collect data off the collars. Uh, these rock dens make our winter den, den work difficult. Often the entrance is not much bigger than a bear's head. The bear's shoulders are very uh, supple and their back is very flexible. They can wiggle down into the rocks into places where we can't get. Uh, we've been to dens and seen the bear and sometimes we can't even uh, sedate them, but sometimes we can sedate them but not get them out. We thought about designing the perfect UNH student that was skinny, strong and flexible. We could lower down by his bootstraps and then pull the whole works out uh, but so far that pro project hasn't worked very well. Here's a yearling bear with its mother in a rock den. And the last type of den I'll talk about are tree dens. Uh, when trees get to be three feet in diameter, these are often boundary line trees or in, in very uh, rocky areas where loggers can't get to them. The center of the tree will rot out, leaving a large cavity. And if there's an opening, the bears will use these for dens. One morning early in April, I got a call from a woman in my hometown of Lyme, New Hampshire. And uh, she said she had a bear in her tree. And sure enough, when I got there, she had a bear in her tree. And I informed her that the bear had been in her tree all winter long. With this complex social behavior, bears have complex communication. In this picture, Squirty is opening and closing her mouth, expelling moist air into the air and picking up scent off the airways. Uh, 
One of the first things I discovered about bears was they have an accessory organ to their vomer or nasal system. It lies in the pocket of the vomer, uh, and, and there's a sensory nerve that comes down to the roof of the mouth. So when they hold a leaf in their mouth, they can tell if uh, the plant is edible or not. Uh, they can also identify other bear scent uh, by holding on to vegetation or twigs that other bears have rubbed against. Uh, then there's a bundle of sensory nerves that go up the vomer and under the brain and scatter, scatter uh, spread out over the roof of the throat. So any scent that comes in through their nose or mouth, they get a vomer or nasal reading on. Uh, the vomer or nasal identifies all new scent and uh, it, they eventually teach um, the nasal epithelium uh, so they can identify scent with that as well. Bears have emotional expression, which is generally honest. Uh, facial expressions, uh, as humans, we have uh, more facial expressions than any animal on earth. We have over 3000 muscles in our face devoted to expression. Uh, I'm only guessing at your expressions right now, but I would guess you have neutral looks on your face, like you'd see on any subway in the world. And, uh, but if somebody were up to something, you all can read that on their face as well. In this picture, Squirty uh, has put one of her cubs up a tree at weaning time. She has uh, eyebrow expression, eye expression, general facial expression, and ear expression. When her ears are pinned like they are with a horse or a deer, it indicates she's uh, aggravated. And in this picture, she has a happy face. Now I have people coming up to me all the time telling about the bears that they've seen. And I often ask them what the bear looked like. And the answer I get, it was black. Bears also have an expression of intention. Now, a lot of scientists believe that only humans can have an intention, but because bears interact with strangers all the time, it makes sense that they would have to have intention as well because we're the only non-human animal that has uh, will regularly uh, communicate and cooperate with strangers. So bears, uh, now they will false charge, which is rushing and swatting the ground and expelling a big blast of air. They'll chomp their teeth, they'll huff and swat. And all, all these means uh, are, are uh, expressions of intention. Uh, they have a function. Uh, I had a scientist here the other day that studied chimpanzees and studied gestures in chimpanzees, which that she considered intentional. And she also considered all the behavior that I showed in these black bears as being intentional as well. Uh, I'm going to show you a video of squirty false charging. It's a very aggressive false charge which only happens when stranger, human strangers were around at my study site. And the context, if you want to understand any bear uh, communication, pay attention to context because it'll let you know why the bear is doing what it's doing. In this case, the National Geographic came and they thought they would film Squirty for eight hours. She thought 35 minutes was more than enough. And this is Squirty asking, uh, the, bit, the film crew to leave. Now, one of the things that was notable in, in uh, um, not thinking of the word, anyways, the, 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 when she gets done false charging, she's looking for a response, which indicates that it's an intentional communication. Now, these varied in intensities. I filmed this one with a handheld camera from 10 feet away. I've been false charged in many different ways. Uh, when I spend time with Squirty, when time came to go because I was taking her time, she was often single to me with a, a false charge. And it might be a simple bow, uh, but she'd let me know that it was time for me to go. And it was done on purpose. Now, this is another bear named Wanda, and you'll see that her false charge is much less aggressive. She has a young cub up a tree, and... Uh... 
she's response monitoring, looking for a response, and then she'll walk right up to me. Now there's a transparency about bears. Um, wherever they travel, they deposit a little bit of scent on any vegetation that touches their fur, feet, or any part of their body that another bear can follow for 48 hours or more. Now, one of the things I, I talked about earlier was that uh, bears have rules. Uh, Squirty has rules and she expected compliance out of her family members. And if one of them uh, didn't follow the rules, she could track them down and punish them. Uh, so bears, wherever they go, whatever they do, uh, another bear can track it down. So it, uh, it, it's, it, it's like us being born with a chip in our neck and the uh, government can track us the rest of our lives. Um, this is Squirty's daughter, SQ2, uh, following a male bear during the breeding season. She's marking over his marks, trying to reconnect with him. Uh, you'll see her back rubbing over it. She's stretching up the tree to smell his scent. That's how I know it's a male. Females stand about five feet tall. The males are about six and a half feet. You'll see those subtle mouth movements. Uh, and she sniffs and licks. And then she marks over his scent. She'll uh, do symbolic marking on the ground, disrupting soil with her feet. She'll be dropping little drops of urine, letting him know that it's her that's looking for him. And finally, she'll walk over a sapling, picking up scent from her underbelly, and it'll flip up behind her, acting like an old factory antenna. These bears are very social, very busy, and they know all the other bears in the forest, so they know who they're communicating with. This last, this clip here, uh, used in my communications paper, which we're trying to get published now. Uh, this is uh, Wanda again. She's got two cubs. She, there's another bear approaching. She's trying to communicate to her cubs the danger. And so she'll start out uh, by chirping and gulping, trying to get their attention. She'll, she'll make gestures towards them, indicating there's a concern around, and they don't have a clue. This is something she has to teach them, a gesture again. She'll walk away, uh, gulping, expecting them to follow her. They don't. Again, they don't have a clue. She turns around. She gets more and more nervous, increasing uh, her communications, more gulps, more gestures, demonstrates what she wants, knows the bear is getting close. Cubs still don't have a clue. Uh, by the end of the summer, she'll have taught them that there's, a, there's danger behind all of her communication. And all she'll have to do is gulp and walk towards the tree and they'll run out in front of her and up the tree. These cubs aren't going to respond until they see the other bear. He continues to get uh, nervous and upset, continues to gesture towards them. Finally, they see the other bear and they climb the tree and reinforces it. And when she chomps, the other bear uh, are right below the tree. These are red pine mark trees uh, that are used for bear communication throughout the forest. During the breeding season, the male bears will advertise on these trees by standing up and back rubbing against them. Uh, the scent that, that they mark with is are large molecules of sebaceous oil that uh, are long lasting but have very little uh, aromatic um, value. They'll turn and bite the tree, releasing aromatic compounds from the tree. Uh, they picked the red pine tree because it has the most aromatic compounds to advertise their scent. Uh, the female may know who she wants to mate with. If she hasn't found him already, she'll go out and check these trees to find the male that she wants to mate with. When she does, she'll mark on the tree and wait nearby. And then when he shows up, uh, they'll get out of the area and travel together. This is a 350 pound male traveling with a female. 
marking over another male scent. Well, again, this is a full back rub. Now, in 2007, I started working with another kind of bear. I was invited to China with a delegation of US scientists uh, that were talking about the effects of climate uh, change on panda habitat. Uh, I gave my, a presentation very much like this one. I was the last presenter, and when I finished, uh, Hu Rong from the Chengdu Pan Panda Base, the Director of Science and Research, came up to me and she said, we noticed your talk was quite a lot different from the other talks. And she said, you make us think. And the next day I was hustled off to the Department of Forestry that manages the wild panda population and all the natural reserves. I gave my talk again, they got very excited. Uh, and then we came back and had to return to the US and it, it was four years and we hadn't heard anything. We thought they forgot about us. And then I was summoned back to China. They had some questions and they wanted to know, uh, I gave another presentation at that time. They wanted to know that if they tried to walk their pandas in the cubs in the wild, uh, wouldn't the panda cub just run off? And in China, uh, there's a fear of failing. Uh, so they were very, uh, cautious about losing a panda cub that might be worth millions of dollars. And uh, and they were also worried that if they had a, a panda like Squirty that they could travel within the forest, uh, that wouldn't the other pandas come and attack uh, their researchers and wouldn't that be dangerous? So we decided the only way they could really find out is to come to the United States. They were coming to the English Learning Center at Drexel University. We've invited them up for an extended weekend, uh, and we took them for a walk in the forest. We had six bottle-fed cubs at the time. The cubs mouthed vegetation. They found a hornet's nest. We took them to a, a red pine mark tree. There was still scent on it from the breeding season. The cubs all got very excited. Uh, they sniffed and licked the scent. They came down and did that funny stiff-legged walk, disrupting soil on the ground and marking with urine. And Hu Rong exclaimed, they can communicate with the wild bears without ever meeting them. She got very excited. That evening, we went up to my study site and Squirty and her cubs came out. Several other wild bears came out. No bears attacked the truck. They got even more excited. They had a seven hour drive back to Philadelphia. They talked the entire way. And several weeks later, uh, we were back in China picking the first cubs for the Panda reintroduction program. Now, our efforts have been uh, documented in the P IMAX Pandas film. Uh, it's something to see in the theaters. Uh, part of it was filmed here at the Kill and Bear Center, the rest in China. Uh, there's a scene uh, at one of the pools in, in the uh, outdoor enclosures in the springtime where there's, as we know, you know, in New England, we have mosquitoes and those 3D cameras pick the mosquitoes up. And if you see it in the theater, the mosquitoes fly right out into the audience and the people in the audience were swatting them, which was pretty amusing for me. Uh, so... To end up tonight, uh, it's time to slide out of here and then we can go to questions. So if anybody has questions, we can do that. All right, thank you so much, Ben, and especially the uh -huh. last video. Uh, can stop. you hear me? I'll stop, share, and see if that's okay. perfect. There we go. How's that? Great. Uh, thank you so much, and thanks for staying a little longer to get to some questions. We all we have a bunch rolling in, so I'm just going to jump right in and ask you um, the ones we already got. So the first one, I saw a mother bear and two cubs last week. Being this late in the season, would they be denning in that area? 
Yes, they would be. Um, if you see a, a mother bear and cubs, that's her home range. And they always den in their home ranges. And you mentioned some fascinating parallels between interacting with strangers in the bear and human worlds. How is working with these bears changed the way you regard human interactions? Well, I understand them a lot better. And I, I think, you know, it, because I my work is working with black bears and not uh, any of the great apes, it won't be recognized for a long time. And I understand that, but I, my, I firmly believe that in time, we're gonna learn more about how humans became humans from black bears than we ever did by, uh, by any of the great apes. The great apes, uh, they have tool use, they, have, they do some pretty remarkable things, but because they live in territories that they can't go beyond, culture lives and dies in those territories. The neighboring territory doesn't have the same culture and culture in black bears spreads rapidly through the population as it did in early human population. Yeah, next one. I'm curious about your long-term goals with respect to New Hampshire black bears. Do you have a sense for larger population, population statistics over time? Are you trying to maintain the population or increase it? And to what extent do you think your work might or might not serve to assist other animals that might be endangered? Well, I, I, it's the Fish and Game Department's managed populations. Uh, I, I, my primary function is, is handling uh, orphan cubs and teaching them about the bear's behavior and teaching people how to coexist with bears. And if you teach people not to be afraid of bears, they're not pushing on uh, game departments uh, to, to keep the bear populations low because they're afraid of them. Uh, right now, we have a healthy population of bears. And, uh, as I talked about, the amount of human foods that enter the population, uh, the reproductive status of the black bears is fairly high. Okay, thank you. And just a reminder, everyone, put the questions in the Q&A box if you can. Um, next question, Why? what should one do when one encounters a black bear in the woods? If you encounter a black bear and uh, if it's walking towards you and he hasn't seen you because they, they identify by smell, may move or talk or do something so it notice, knows you're there. Uh, but if you just see one at a distance, enjoy watching them. Uh, they're not out to hurt you. Bears have no interest in humans, only interest in our foods. Um, so, but if you have a close contact where you get a, a false charge running into a sow with young cubs, if she false charges you on a walking trail, it's because she thinks you're going to attack her. So always de-escalate the situation, uh, hold your ground, talk softly to her, and uh, within three to five minutes, she'll walk away from you as soon as she sees that you're not a threat. And do young bears imprint on human caregivers like birds do? What's that? Do young bears imprint on human caregivers like birds do? No, they don't. Uh, you know, they, they uh, the human caregiver, we use a single caregiver system, uh, and it's a matter of trust. Uh, but if a stranger you went in there or anybody else went in there, the bears wouldn't react the same to them. And the example I use is uh, mothers with children. You know, if you go out into a crowd of people, your children go up, don't go up and hug strangers. They can tell the difference. And bears can as well. Do you, do you try to have limited contact with the bear cubs so that when they are released, they won't be used to human contact? Um, we use a single caregiver system. Uh, the cubs that are the most difficult are the bottle-fed cubs, uh, but they tend to do very well. Squirty, uh, that I talked about, that's 28 years old and became the dominant female, was a bottle-fed cub, and she, she became, uh, again, the dominant female of the area and lived 20, is, is still alive at 28 years old. 
And on that note, can you say a little bit more about how you reintroduce the bears into the wild at 18 months? Well, unfortunately, with a uh, squirty was what we call a soft release. I had, you know, she was the only set of cubs I had that year, and I uh, built a remote enclosure on a 400-acre piece of property that I had, and they were they were released out of there. Squirty was the dominant female. She chased off her sister. The male uh, went into dispersal, and she stayed there. Uh, but now, if I tried to put any other cub up there, she's the dominant female and she'd chase it off. So with the bears that we have now, they get a hard release, which means the Fish and Game Department comes and gets them and takes them to release sites. They disperse from there and they may go uh, stay there if it's good food year or they may travel up to 100 miles from the release site. Right, we'll just do a few more. Um, if a bear family is hunted, hunted, how would another bear family know if it could move into their territory? Would there be a period of time before another family would come into the territory? Well, it, it, as I said, the female, if there's a female in your area, it's a, it's a hierarchy, probably a matrilinear hierarchy like I documented. So there would be another female there related to the first female that would simply take, take over the home range. And uh, assumedly bears vary in their aptitudes, intelligence. Do any display more complex creative uses of their communication mechanisms? Would you repeat, repeat that one? Um, do any bears display more complex creative uses of their communication mechanisms uh, compared to other bears? Um, you know, not all the bears are as well studied as I've studied the black bear, um, but there's signs of all the other bears having complex uh, systems like I see in the black bear. That organ that I uh, discovered, which I coined the killum organ, exists in all the bears except the panda. Um, and I, I see behavior similar to the black bear's behavior in all the other bears. They differ because of the niche they're in, um, but a lot of their behaviors are the same. I'll do just two more because one is really short. Um, how old is the oldest bear that you have released? Well, we release them all at 18 months. We don't keep any bears. Uh, this year, we happen to have one bear that's older than that. And it's because he had a brain injury. He was struck by a car and found in a snowbank, and he's uh, been steadily recovering. So we're hoping we'll be he'll be able to be released. But he's he's still with us. Uh, he's two years old now, and the rest of them are a year, about a year old. So. And I think a good question to end on: um, Are there volunteer opportunities in Lyme, New Hampshire? area or with your organization? That you Unfor have? Unfortunately, they're not. Um, again, we're a single caregiver system. Our goals are putting bears back in the woods uh, that are successful as the wild bear population and have low human conflict rates, um, which is what we have right now. Um, survival is the same as the wild bear population and the conflict rates are lower than the wild population. Right. I want to be mindful of your time, Ben. Um, thanks so much for joining us tonight and for the wonderful presentation and the Q&A. Um, it, was, it was really great. Uh, and thank you everyone at home for joining us tonight. Uh, please visit walden.org to find out more about our upcoming events. We'll have um, the winter events posted on there soon. Um, and lastly, if anyone wants or is able to make a donation to Kill and Bear, um, Center or the Walden Woods Project, uh, we would be very grateful. Um, I'll put our links to our organizations in the chat. Um, but once again, thank you everybody for joining and thank you, Ben. And follow us on, on Instagram. You'll see a lot of bears and bear behavior. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Night, everyone. Night.